Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And um, the little fuss with here was because Professor Allen here, who's to be our first speaker tonight, was due to um, leave Brisbane at two, uh, but he didn't leave till four. But he's here. He's here. Anyway, good evening and, and welcome to, to this annual Big Ideas Forum of the Centre for Independent Studies. My name is Greg Lindsay and I'm the Centre's ex Executive Director. Let me thank at this point the Australian newspaper which has, has supported the 2011 Forum and a number of other activities around this time, including a luncheon address tomorrow by Paul Wolfowitz and last week our annual Acton Lecture. The Big Ideas Forum has been held now for eight years and repeats for the public one of the sessions from, from our annual conference, Concilium, held, at the week, held just this weekend. Topics in the past have included uh, the future of Europe, Europe, which was last year, the relevance today of the Enlightenment, and are we entering the Asian century, and many others. The big idea to be discussed tonight has had a fair bit of airtime lately, which probably means there are some underlying trends we should be concerned about. Freedom of speech is something that anyone of a liberal disposition uh, should cherish for all the good reasons we know. Some of the old-fashioned restrictions on free speech no longer exist. Um, the recent calls by political figures here and elsewhere who should know better uh, for effectively closing off debates and setting rules that might restrict what some, especially media outlets, might say is a very worrying trend. So, some group or other, including media outlets, mightn't like some policy or other. Well, that's what they're meant to do. So, and what simpli simplicity calls for regulation show a complete failure of confidence in the ability to argue a point or an idea or a policy. Naked restrictions like this are only part of the story. There seems to be a broader issue which will be central to tonight's discussion. Popularly called political correctness, it manifests itself in some form of conformism ab about what the prevailing occupiers of the citadel citadels of communications in the broader sense, uh, believe and what they feel should be conveyed to the world. Now, in the end, that's probably no big deal and perhaps represents a failure of those with different views to attempt to occupy the very same citadels. After all, we're in a contest of ideas and failure to come to terms with this is not much of a contest. CIS as an organisation has long defended this contest of ideas and tried to be there as often and as strongly as we can while, main while maintaining civility in the discourse. There are, of course, a lot of things that we may not like to hear, and they're downright offensive to us and many others, but that's also the price we need to pay for the freedom to say what we and what you wish to say. In a free society, we all have the perfect right to turn off, close the book, or not turn up. Anyway, this is not a platform for me. We have four eminently qualified speakers to discuss this issue, and at the end of their presentations, we would like to also to hear from you. I'll read them in this order, but because things have been swapping around <laughs> with Jim finally getting here. Uh, Janet Albrechtson, of course, is well known to, to all, who, I'm sure. She writes a weekly column for The Australian. She's also, <coughs> excuse me, written for the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, Australian Financial Review, Quadrant, The Wall Street Journal, and Can Canada's National Post, Vancouver Sun, and The Calgary Herald. After receiving her LLB from the University of Adelaide, Janet worked as a solicitor at Freehills in Sydney. After s deciding to switch from commerce to academia, she acquired a doctorate in law from the University of Sydney Law School and also taught there. She became a weekly contributor to The Australian in 2002. She was a member of the Foreign Affairs Council of the Federal Government from 2004 to 7, and in 2005 she was appointed Director of the Board of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation for a five-year term. At the other end there, Brendan O'Neill, as well as being the editor of the UK's online publication Spiked, Brendan writes on war, terrorism and politics for Spiked. He also re he's also a regular contributor to the Christian Science Monitor. He's been wi widely published in The Spectator, The Guardian, The New Statesman, The Sunday Times, BBC Online, Reason Magazine and American Prospect. And of course, for those who have been reading The Australian over the last few weeks, see he's popping up here pretty regularly as well. Brendan founded the online journalism course at the Surrey Institute of Art and Design in Surrey in England. Tilo Sarazen studied economics at the University of Bonn. He served in various functions in the Federal Ministries of Labour and Finance and was Under Secretary in the Minister of Finance in the state of rhineland pfalz and was a board member and CEO in two public companies. From 2002 to 2009, he was a Senator of Finance in the state of Berlin. There he managed to change the deficit of 5.2 billion euros, or 25% of the budget, to the first surplus in the post-war history of Berlin. 
In May, t uh, May 2009, he became a board member of the Deutsche Bundesbank. He stepped down from this office in, se in September 2010 when his book, and I won't pronounce it in German, but in English it roughly means Germany does away with itself, caused such a heated public discussion. But at the same time, the, bo the book managed to sell nearly one and a half million copies. James Allen is the Garrick Professor of Law at the University of Queensland. Native-born Canadian, Jim has practiced law in a large Toronto law firm and then at the bar in London. He has taught law in Hong Kong, New Zealand, Canada and Australia. He's a doctorate from the University of Hong Kong and degrees, uh, and degrees from the London School of Economics and, the Queen and Queen's University, Canada. Jim was active in the successful efforts to oppose and prevent a National Bill of Rights in Australia. Indeed, he's, he is delighted to have moved to a country without a National Bill of Rights, but he laments the innovative state of federalism in this country. He's also published widely on constitutional law and legal and moral philosophy. His latest book is The Vantage of Law, uh, a monograph from the Ashgate Applied Legal Philosophy series. He writes regularly for The Australian, there seems to be a theme here, uh, Spectator <laughs> and Quadrant. Uh, uh, and we'll be speaking in that and in order running across the room. A format that each speaker will speak for 10, 12 or so minutes and then we'll have a Q&A session. They'll speak in succession, so hold your questions uh, until, until the end of, of, the, of the presentations. We were to have two microphones, but unfortunately one seems to have died. Uh, so th we will ask you please to, to get up to the microphone to ask your question. It is being filmed and recorded, so if you're shy, stay there. So, <laughs> so it's my pleasure to ask Professor Allen to speak to us. Well, thank you very much for having invited me. And isn't this the perfect place, the Grand Masonic Lodge, to have a discussion on political correctness? I did, uh, I did text uh, Greg and suggest maybe we could build a volcano and sacrifice a virgin, but uh, he told me he didn't think he had time to find one, which surprised me because I thought my co-panelist, Brendan, might volunteer himself, but he didn't. Uh. <laughs> right, well, anyway, uh, a few minutes to talk on political correctness. Look, I, I just I want to give you a framework, a template, um, so I'm going to do three things. I want to outline what I think are three, the three main types of political correctness, because I think we use the pejorative label to uh, refer to three different, not always the same sin. Uh, having done that, then I'll speculate on the motives for being politically correct. And uh, I, I have a slightly more open mind on this, having heard uh, Brendan on the weekend. So uh, I'm not totally committed to mine. This is on the motive front. And then thirdly, I'm going to tell you why I think uh, fighting back against political correctness matters. S but the first and most important sort of political correctness, or for me anyway, the most dangerous type, uh, here's how an American pundit defined it. And again, I think this is just one sort of political correctness, but he said, political correctness refers to the resistance from descriptions of reality because of the way they may be perceived by groups to whom our elites have decided to be hypersensitive. So the idea is that certain well-placed uh, elites in society take particular subjects off, off the table. They limit what is seen to be acceptable in polite company, or what is acceptable to talk about in polite company, and the topics that get taken off the table are ones that involve a hypersensitivity to the feelings of certain groups in society. Not all groups. Uh, you can say pretty much anything you like about Christians or paint anything you like about Christ, um, but different rules apply to, say, um, Islam. So what is acceptable there is much more constrained. So with this first sort of political correctness, you're almost talking about a group right not to be offended, but it's only for a favored um, few groups. So, for instance, Andrew Bolt gets taken to court for voicing an opinion, which really boils down to uh, which sorts of Aboriginal individuals ought to receive what amount to affirmative action benefits or perks. We can all have different views on that. Um, but the fact is that his view is um, one that uh, allows people, because of their hurt feelings, to start a court action. Um, now, it, it strikes me that none of the supporters of that hate speech legislation and court action would dream of supporting a hurt feelings court action if we change the scenario when we imagine, say, um, a group of Americans who were offended, honestly, sincerely offended by other people who were burning the American flag. They wouldn't say, well, you ought to be able to take those people to court because of your hurt feelings. So, or at least I dare say there'd be a different reaction from many of the people who, who support the, uh, 
legislation that allows people to take Andrew Bolt to court. So you can see then that this first sort of political correctness has a corollary that really amounts to a group right not to be offended. And it only applies to a select or favored few groups, doesn't apply to everyone. So everyone outside the favored circle basically has to buck up and have a thick skin, which is my view of what we all should have to do. You take offensive words on the chin, um, and other groups don't have to do this. Now don't get me wrong, every society on earth puts some limits on speech, even the Americans who formally have the most protections. You can't counsel murder, uh, there's limits on um, some forms of obscenity. <clears throat> if you go to any American political or any American university, you can't say anything, but um, that's not a legal limit, that's just, uh, I can tell you, that's just a self-imposed one. But, um, so we're not talking about that, we're talking here though about how much scope you want people how much scope do you want to basically be able to speak your mind? And I, I want as much as possible. So uh, the problem with political correctness in my first form is it limits, to some extent, what you can say, at least about certain favored groups. They don't have to have as thick a skin as the rest of us. And in fact, political correctness leads people to censor themselves to some extent. Um, and it gnaws away at free speech. So I've said this plenty of times, but I'll say it again. The only kind of free speech that I think matters is the kind that protects offensive speech. If you have a protection of free speech that amounts to protecting speech that we all want to hear, you know, the kind of speech that you can just imagine us all sitting around in circles, we're holding hands, uh, Oliver's playing the guitar, and we're all singing Kumbaya, that's worthless. Protecting that kind of speech is worthless because we all agree. The only kind of protections for free speech that matters are kinds that people don't want to hear that offend people. Um, so it's precisely that sort of um, free speech, I think, that this first strand of political correctness gnaws away at. And it's important that um, you recognize, that I think that's the most important strand. Now, if you want egregious examples of this, there's lots of them. Um, the Andrew Bolt trial here in Australia, because often this is linked to, I think, hate speech laws that overreach. Um, in Canada, there's loads more examples, because one of the things I'll say at the end is that Australia probably is less politically correct. Well, I know it's less politically correct than Canada, New Zealand, and I would probably say the U.S. too. But we're going in the wrong direction. At any rate, in Canada, there's examples of Mark Stein. Most of you will know that. Ezra Levant. There's a great one uh, that I like. There's a Canadian stand-up comedian. His name is Guy Earl. True story. He was practicing his profession, which is stand-up comedy. Um, in the course of one of his acts, two women started to heckle him. Um, he started making jokes at the two hecklers about um, their being lesbians. Bad luck for him, they were. Um, <coughs> he got taken to court. He had to pay a big fine. He basically hasn't worked since. You see, in Canada, apparently, you can't mock lesbians who pay to come to your show and who heckle you. You can't respond to that. Um, there's lots of more serious examples in Europe, Gert Wielders, Lars, excuse my pronunciation, Hedegaard, there's a Viennese mother, Elizabeth Sabich wolf you'll hear from some others. The only thing that drives these prosecutions really is the perceived insult. You know, usually the defendant is barred from proving the truth of the statement. That's what happened with Mark Stein. He couldn't prove in court that what he said was true, which is bizarre. And I can only hope that a future government here in Australia repeals that awful Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act. Look, Lots of people say things that we don't agree with that are awful, but you just have to suck it up sometimes. You don't have to go and read John Stuart Mill to realize that there's a lot, I mean, the best justification for free speech is if you believe that in the competition of ideas, you move forward. And that means you have to hear things you don't agree with and you find offensive. So that's what I'd say is strand number one of political correctness. A less important strand, but one that's, you know, out there for sure, um, so it also gets labeled political correctness, has to do with what I call regulatory overkill. Think of health and safety regulations or rules or an over-obsession with equality. So now you can think of all the over-top government regulations to do with school playgrounds, risk assessment forms. Um, you know, in the university, you have to fill out eight forms to do anything. Warning signs that you're about to drink hot coffee. Uh, police dire directives in the UK about how to eat your lunch. There's all the tort law idiocies that come out of the US. Um, my personal experience, because I lived 11 years in Dun Dunedin uh, until I moved over here six years ago. So my son, who was 11 when we move over, you only have to say the word all blacks and he puts on a black shirt and is hoping for the all blacks, otherwise really Australian. But the one that really has struck me and continues to strike me is when you 
lived in New Zealand and roadworks were being done, you would have the team of people actually doing the roadworks, jackhammers, everything, and there might be one orange cone five feet in front of the work. I moved to Australia, and what I discovered is you can't actually do roadworks um, without an, an Iraq war army of safety officers, lights, people directing traffic, five or six IR consultants. Um, it's unbelievable. I still can't get over it that there's more people directing the traffic than actually doing anything. That is not the way it works. So uh, that's, a, that's an example on the health and safety front. I'm sure you all have your own. On the uh, over-obsession with equality, um, here's a good example. It's a very recent one. The European Court of Justice recently, and this is binding on the UK. I feel sorry for the UK. Um, Teenage girls, they decided, have to pay the same for car insurance as teenage boys. The facts of life, or at least the overwhelming actuarial evidence of who drives better, being totally irrelevant. Um, you, see, you see, it prompted one critic in the UK to say about this ruling that these judges and lawyers have become so infatuated with the concept of anti-discrimination in the abstract that they really can't distinguish between Nazis and actuaries. Um, so that's another kind of political correctness, the kind that we laugh about. It's not as serious as the first kind that stifles free speech. Um, that leaves me just a bit of time then to move on to strand three. This is the third sin that usually it, or often attracts the label political correctness. And I sort of summarize it as the rise of the humorless, po-faced neo-prudes. You know, people who can't laugh at anything, and they don't want anyone else to either. Um, Latter-day Puritans... We see them in Parliament, we see them in the newspapers, we see them throughout the ABC. You know, they're basically today's version of Cromwell's roundheads. Um, let me tell you a true story. I'm going to say it even though it's on camera. Um, it happened to me two or three years ago. Um, I was picking up my son from school. He was in year 10. Uh, he just finished cricket practice. And by the way, I do brag to people I'm the only Canadian on the planet who knows how to score cricket. You have to do something on those... Saturdays when you're there. Um, so anyway, I was picking him up for cricket practice and year 10, and he gets in the car, and as we're driving home, he says, Dad, do you know what a stereotype is? And I said, uh, I think so. Why do you ask? And he said to me, Dad, how do you know it's an Asian who's broken into your house? And I said, I have no idea. He said, Dad, you get home, your homework's done, the dog's missing, and the thief is still trying to back out of the driveway. <laughs> now, this is what a teacher at my son's school used to start a discussion about stereotypes. If you don't think that's a fantastic way for a teacher to introduce a discussion about stereotypes, why they develop, why they've always been around, how they can mislead, not least because teenagers respond to humor in a way they don't respond to preaching and puritanical you know, certitudes from on high, it would never, ever, ever have happened in Canada. It was one of the great things I was... You know, I was never moving my son from that school once it happened because kids are pretty astute in some ways. They, get, they just don't respond to being preached at. So I think humor can be a victim of political correctness too. And in fact, you know, it is. So that's a quick summary then of the three main types of political correctness to me. Now, let's just have a quick think about what can motivate this sort of political correctness. Um, subject to some of the things Brendan's going to say later. Um, the first one, the important one, the speech-stifling sort of political correctness that favors certain groups in society. Here's what Mr. Bean, that's the English comedian Rowan Atkinson, very funny man, he condemns this as the ridiculous right not to be offended. Isn't that ridiculous? He says what we really need is a right to offend. You know, and that's especially true in today's Western world where there's so many people out there who seem to see it as their life work to be offended. The, they have a commitment to trying to be offended. So I put this down to two main causes, and I, and I emphasize main. I think there's a sort of poser moralism out there, the sort of bumper sticker moralizing, where you're trying to exhibit your superior moral uh, antenna. And the second factor, I think, that's sometimes underplayed is fear. Um, and the good example of that is with the Danish cartoons about, Muslim, or about to Muhammad and the absolutely spineless response that, that was exhibited after that by the press around, uh, around the world. Now look, they knew that a very small slice of Muslim extremists sometimes deliver on their threats, but they do actually create murderous mayhem. So in response to the Danish cartoons, these newspapers, not all of them, but the vast preponderance took the path of least resistance. Now, 
my view, and my, I'm sort of a subject of my upbringing, but I went to a state school in Toronto, and I always, I soon learned that the, there's one proper response to bullying. It's when you stand up and you, you cause the person, you go down fighting. You make the stakes so high, you're going to do nothing else but look the person in the face. You might lose, but you're going to go down fighting. It's the only response to bullying. I think that every newspaper in the world, papers that would never have dreamed of publishing this, these cartoons, never, but having been threatened, the proper response is for every single one of those papers to have put the cartoons on the front page. That would have been the end of it. There would be no more threats. That's how you respond to bullying. It is not by weak, vacillating, fear-driven responses. So although there's a certain poser moralism here that motivates a lot of this first kind of per, per, you know, PC-ness, fear is also a factor, I think. Um, the over-obsession with personal safety, that sort of political correctness, the, the kind that we laugh about, you know, if you ever get, the, I don't know if anyone subscribes to The Week, but The Week lists all the idiocies in Britain every, uh, every week, and it's that sort of PC-ness they, they always talk about, the health and safety kind. Um, well, I just think some people prefer to dwell in this warm, fuzzy world of uh, moral abstraction, so it's all about personal safety. Nobody ever stops to ask hard questions like, well, if we do a cost-benefit analysis, is it really better to make people wear helmets when they ride bicycles? It's not at all clear that it is. When you weigh it all up and you factor in obesity and health and all sorts of things, admitting that once every, you know, I don't know, four or 500,000 times not wearing a bicycle helmet might cause problems, might kill somebody, but nobody wants to ask those sort of questions, and you end up with this mania for uh, zero, zero tolerance, um, which actually can have bad long-term consequences. Uh, the third strand of constraining what we can laugh about, I reckon just some people are born without a sense of humor. I don't know what else to say. They don't want anyone else to laugh because they can't. Um, and, you know, I just, I don't know what else to say. There's, you've got your cavaliers and you've got your roundheads. Um, now, this takes us why, to why this all needs to be fought. It's just a fact, I think, that on questions like, should, what are we going to do about the Ground Zero Mosque, or what are we going to do about border control policies, or gay marriage, or you know, coal-fired power stations in Australia? It's just not true to think that one side of the argument has some sort of pipeline to God, and a really their moral sentiments quiver at just the right uh, frequency, and the other people are all racist, sort of substandard human beings. The fact is that in any population of tens of millions of people, you just have honest agreement, disagreement between smart, reasonable, nice people. That's a sensible way to see the world. An unsensible way to see the world is to think, after four billion years of evolution, I am the one whose moral sentiments are always right, and everyone who disagrees with me is defective, which is what you hear again and again from a lot of people. They don't really put it that way, but that's honestly what they're thinking. Um, I'm sure you've tuned into the ABC on occasion. You'll get the sense. Um, <laughs> so... The demands of political correctness are such that this becomes the sort of default explanation for disagreement. It's pathetic. Um, so standing up to political correctness matters because it involves standing up for free speech. Uh, because not just for free speech in some sort of libertarian abstract sense, because I'm not like that, but because when you weigh up the costs and benefits, you get a lot more benefits than costs when you let people talk, especially people that offend you and disagree with you. Sure, you don't want anyone to counsel murder, but we're not even, you know, we go, we go way too far the other way. Um, so this sort of free-flowing back and forth contest of ideas where you don't rule some people out as beyond the pale in advance, it's crucial not only to having a successful democracy, it's crucial to having good policy making um, where, you know, there's nothing worse than being surrounded by yes men except in your marriage. I haven't been lucky enough to really experience that, but I can make that exception. But leaving that aside, um, so it's crucial to, you know, to having your ideas be able to withstand critical attack. Now, maybe in question time, people might want to raise some examples of political correctness that are worth raising, like the Larry Summers incident at Harvard, or um, you know, the idea of profiling in airports where they, they feel constrained to treat my you know, my mother, who's 80, an 80-year-old grandmother gets treated the same as a 20-year-old Arab male because, you know, we have to pretend that the risks are the same when no sane person actually thinks they are. Or, um, you know, the foolhardy, I think, desire to try to create, extend privacy entitlements. Uh, you only have to see how that's working in New Zealand. Or the, you know, the, we could, the thoroughgoing awfulness of the political correctness in Australian universities. But 
you know, I'll leave that for potential questions because it's uh, my time's up. But l let me just finish by thanking Greg and uh, the CIS for holding these sorts of evenings and uh, bringing these sort of uh, issues to the attention of everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, until 2008, I, I did not concern myself very much with uh, the political the correctness. I was uh, too busy doing other things. In my the career as a the civil servant, as a the board member and executive in different uh, enterprises and later on as a the politician politician I had uh, the reputation for being for being outspoken because it's my way of expressing myself but that concerned uh, the mostly my the professional field and was the therefore accepted everything the changed with an uh, interview that I gave in September uh, the 2009 about uh, the social economic the problems of Berlin and and their roots and with the books that I the published in August two, uh, 2007 it has a title Deutschland schafft sich ab that Germany abolishes itself in English it's the main conclusions are uh, the Germany as a nation is doomed by its about its demography, the, the low and stable birth rate means that every the generation is about 30, 35% smaller than the one before. Second, the brightest people have the, the fewest children, and for this reason, intellectual, the capacities and educational achievements in the Germany the, the will to shrink even faster than the, the, the population shrinks. This is no danger for the far the future. This is already in full swing. Third, the kind of immigration that we have in Germany, mostly from Islamic uh, the countries in Africa and in the Middle East, does not solve the problems. It, uh, it uh, um, makes them more difficult. It aggravates them. The reason for this is the Islamic cultural background and the poor average educational performance of these groups, which is, uh, the which is far below the, the European uh, average, even in the second and the third the generation. The so far, uh, my book. These conclusions are, of course, uh, the controversial, and, the, and they were intended to be. Because in matters of society, there is there no such thing as an absolute truth. And I'm the first to admit this. So I had expected uh, the controversial discussion. But nothing had prepared me for the, the public storm that broke loose upon publication of my book. I was accused of advocating biological determinism I uh, uh, learned this first, this, this word first in the discussion of my book, and I was the labeled a uh, social Darwinist, a racist, and an enemy of the people, and an enemy of the social justice. I survived morally and the political only because of the, the enthusiastic support from large parts of the, the general public and the, the new media were also very helpful in this regard. In this uh, case, the, uh, the print media and the, the television had obviously lost their the monopoly of interpretation, and this was plain for everybody to see. The realizing this, many politicians started a uh, tactical withdrawing from uh, the withdrawal from the debate at first they had all been all been uh, over me and then after discovering that in the polls uh, the majority of the people that supported my views they were getting more 
cautious. In the, in the course of events, I stepped down as a board member of the Deutsche Bundesbank, but not before I had been formally cleared from all allegations of misconduct in the following months. I thought a lot about the, the controversial reactions on my book, and my the theory is as follows. The, the code of conduct in a society which is not laid down by law varies over time. It is, it is to a large degree implicit and not subject to formal or even openly discussed rules. But those members who do, do not observe it run the risk of uh, being excluded from the so-called good society. Having and expressing the, the right set of opinions about certain the scientific, social, and political questions is an important part of this code of conduct. Most people want to observe the prevailing code of conduct, but being busy with their jobs and their families, they have no informed opinion on their own on most matters. So they think and believe what the media say they should think and believe. Politicians, on the other hand, form their understanding of the public opinion by consuming the media. Most of them sincerely believe that voters think what the media write or say they think. Media are made by people. And media people, they recruit themselves in the process of the self-selection, much as lawyers, doctors, or engineers do. So there is a uh, the particular code of the social group. Polls show that uh, media people mainly listen to other media people. Endorsed by this self-selection, media people on the whole have a set of opinions that tends to be on the left side of uh, the, the mainstream society, and this, this is uh, true for all kinds of Western societies. I don't say this is a bad thing in itself, but I think that this partly explains the mindset of political correctness. Most people shy away from saying or even thinking anything that is perceived to be politically incorrect. So the mechanics of political correctness that prevent the uh, expression of dissenting uh, the opinions, the notwithstanding the, the formal freedom of speech. It even stops uh, the generation of incorrect thoughts. The, the prevailing themes of political correctness are deeply ingrained in the, to some degree, unconscious mindset of the political class and of the media. The reflection on the reaction, uh, the reflecting on the direction to my book, I identified 13 themes which constitute the main body of political correctness in Germany. My book, The Violet, did, as I discovered in uh, hindsight, every single one of them. Here is a list of political correctness in Germany. I think the list describes the truth, but it takes some irony or sense of the humor to really understand it fully. The, the problem lies not in any single item on this list, but in the combination and in, in the rigid application to political thinking and to any form of uh, uh, the publicly expressing oneself. And here is a list. First, inequality is bad. Equality is good. Second, uh, the secondary virtues like industriousness, the precision, the punctuality are of no particular value. Competition is morally questionable, except in sports, because it promotes inequality. Third, the rich should feel guilty. Exception 
rich people who have earned their money as athletes or pop stars. <laughs> fourth, different con uh, fourth, different conditions of life has nothing to do with people's choices, but with the circumstances they are in. Fifth, all cultures are of equal rank and value. They especially uh, the values and ways of life of the Christian Occident or of Western industrialized countries should not enjoy any preference. Those who think differently are the, are the provincial and the xenophobic. Six, Islam is a religion of peace. Those who see any problems with immigration from Islamic countries are guilty of Islamophobia. This is nearly as bad as anti-Semitism. Seventh, Western industrialized uh, the nations carry the main responsibility for poverty and backwardness in other parts of the world. Eighth, men and women have no the national differences except for the, the physical signs of their sex. Ninth, the human abilities depend mainly on training and education. The inherited differences play hardly any role. Tenth, there are no differences between, uh, between peoples and races except for their physical appearance. Eleventh, the, the nation state is an outdated model. The national identities and the peculiarities have no particular value. The, the national element as such is rather bad. It is, a, it, it is at any rate not worth co uh, the preserving. The, the future belongs to the, the, to the, the world society. Twelfth, all people in the world do not only have equal rights, they are in fact equal. They should at least all be, uh, all be eligible for the, the benefits of the, the German welfare state. <laughs> this is no joke. There are people in uh, the Germany who think just that. Thirteenth, children are an entirely private affair. Immigration takes care of the, the labor market and of any other demographic problems. So far the list. In this condensed form, it sounds like a, a joke, but it is not a joke. These are the hidden axioms of political correctness in Germany and probably elsewhere as I see them. There are other points uh, which one uh, that could also make the environment and uh, uh, other things, but, these are the, but this is the list which is most important in Germany. Every item on, the, on this list has, has uh, the, for those who propose it, a high emotional value and therefore uh, is always a danger of uh, uh, injuring those people if, one, uh, if, they, uh, uh, if, if they regard somebody as being of a different opinion in this particular point. The core of the problem is partly moral and partly ideological attitudes are taken at face value and mixed up with reality. To show it as the example of equality, of course it is the right social and moral norm to regard all people as having equal rights and as uh, earning equal opportunities. But this does not mean that they are equal. And if one confuses those two matters, one gets a wrong outlook on the reality and therefore in the end comes to wrong solutions and wrong answers. It is a, a, the, it is a the permanent task I'm afraid to sort that out. It makes me faintly optimistic though that after all the, uh, the turmoil, I'm still morally alive. 
and not as a person and author buried and ignominiously forgotten. That had uh, certainly been the attention of the vast majority of the political and the media class, in my case, in Germany. But for once, the, the general, uh, 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 the public publicly disagreed. This in itself is a matter of the satisfaction not only for me, but for many people in Germany. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Greg. Um, Jim, I just need to raise something with you. If we're having a competition between New Zealand and Australia when it comes to PC and safety, um, I recall being in New Zealand not so long ago and I couldn't even blow dry my hair in the bathroom lest I electrocute myself. Although I must, I must say it's a close run thing because um, we recently bought a new house and I can't get hot water. Um, we are now mandated to have a certain temperature and I asked the plumber to turn it up, but no, you're not allowed to, lest we burn ourselves. So, yeah, it's happening everywhere. Um, I just want to make one quick mention. Greg mentioned uh, when he read out our bios that there seems to be a theme going on. And uh, it's no coincidence that we have the Australian and the CIS here because um, you won't find a think tank in Australia more devoted to free speech and you certainly won't find a newspaper more devoted to free speech. So it's a great honour to be here. Um, <laughs> when it comes to political correctness, I tend to defer to what Mark Twain said. Uh, when, when he knew something about political correctness, when he said, sometimes I wonder whether the world is run by smart people who are putting us on or by imbeciles who really mean it. It's tempting to assume that the PC crowd is having us on and I could regale you with any number of stories, such as the Seattle school that last year renamed Easter eggs as Spring Spheres, <laughs> worrying that a chocolate egg might after all remind young kids about the resurrection of Jesus Christ or that Sesame Street has been sanitised so that any episodes um, that were made between 1969 and 1974 now are aired with adults-only warnings, and I kid you not. That Enid Blyton has not been spared, of course, that uh, to appease the Don't Smack Children lobby, Dame Slap has now been named Dame Snap. And feminists have been accommodated too, so that Julian and Dick are now required to do household chores along with the female characters. And the gay lobby, of course, has not been forgotten either. The word gay has been replaced with the word happy. And Bessie has be, been renamed Beth to avoid any connotations to slavery. I must say that one went completely over my head. And Enid Blyton's gollywogs, well, of course, they've been banished too. The Lion King, well, we could talk about how it's full of racist and homophobic messages, according to Carolyn Newberger from, the Harvard from Harvard University, who said that those good-for-nothing hyenas are nothing more than urban blacks who speak in gay cliches. Surely they're having us on, right? But of course we know they're not having us on, and these are not imbeciles who really mean it either. These are very smart people who really mean it. Smart because the PC virus has infected so much of what we do, how we live, what we read and how we think. And I think it's the thinking part that should trouble us the most. Earlier this year, Alan Gribben, an English professor at Auburn University in Alabama, joined with a publisher to produce a new version of Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. In, Huck, in the new Huck Finn, the word nigger, which appears over 200 times in the original, has been replaced with the word slave. The professor worried that the word offended too many children so that the book would not be read. But as you may know, Huck Finn satirises southern prejudices of the time. It is in fact an anti-racist book. And if you mess with the power of Twain's words, you mess with the power of Twain's message. And if school children are to really think about American history, for example in the Deep South, they need to read about niggers. The history and the language are certainly confronting. But then great literature unsettles us, it's meant to. It forces us to think about our reactions. If we're offended, we think about why we're, why we're offended. By denying us the ability to think, political correctness is a heresy if we're truly committed to liberalism. Political correctness, after all, aims, us, aims to tell us what to think. And it seeps into so many parts of society so often without us even paying attention to its aim. Because the purveyors of political correctness are not imbeciles, because they are smart people armed with clever tricks, we do need to pay more attention. 
In the last few weeks, some on the left have claimed that those who have raised questions about multiculturalism, immigration, and the relationship between Islam and modernity have blood on our hands. I say our hands because I've been named as someone who bears some responsibility for what happened in Oslo. Others to be uh, named as being complicit, complicit in the mass murder include Keith Winchuttle, Andrew Bolt, and Geoffrey Blaney. Now here we have murder being used as a muzzle, used to close down free speech. And this is just the latest addition to what is now a growing list of tactics to curb free speech, or and even worse, to stifle genuine inquiry and independent thinking. So let me go quickly through some of the tricks. If you want to immediately close down discussion about, say, immigration or border control, you can choose from a range of emotionally charged tools. You, cause your, you call your opponents racists and point to xenophobia in the community. Opponents are not just wrong, they're evil, and therefore their views should not be aired in a civilised society. John Howard, as we know, copped this for years. And even Prime Minister Julia Gillard, when she called for an open debate about these issues last year, well, right on cue, she too was accused of whipping up the racists within Australia. But remember this, the stifling political correctness that rejected an open debate about immigration in the early 1990s helped fuel the emergence and popularity of Pauline Hanson. It brings me to the victim game. It's been fueled by two recent developments. We now live in an age when feelings are treated as a measurement of moral values so that you measure your feelings against the feelings of other to determine morality. Hence, we live in what uh, author Monica Alley calls the marketplace of outrage, where groups vie for victimhood status, each claiming that their feelings have been hurt more than others. Secondly, we've seen this focus on vulnerability is used as justification enough to curb enlightenment values, such as freedom of expression. And as a member of a minority, you simply you need only utter the word phobia to close down debate. Now, over the last few years, we have witnessed um, what has become a familiar opera of Muslim oppression used to shut down debate on this front. The first act starts with something simple. Perhaps it's a book called Satanic Verses, or a silly Danish cartoon, or a fil film called Submission, or even a cheeky episode by South Park that sends up the fact that Muhammad seems to be the only guy free from ridicule. The first act, now this, then comes the libretto. Muslims, or a small but vocal minority of Muslims, scream about hurt feelings. The drama builds in this second act. Death threats are issued, flags and a few effigies are burned, and maybe even a few boycotts imposed. And then we hear that great aria of all accusations, Islamophobia. The third act, of course, is the most depressing. The West capitulates, preferring the path of least resistance to launching a staunch defence of freedom of expression. Hence, the then US President George H.W. Bush declared both Salman Rushdie's book and the fatwa against Salman Rushdie as equally offensive. Hence, 20 years later, as Jim mentioned, newspapers across the globe refused to publish the Danish cartoons and politicians muttered something about hurt feelings. Hence, last year, Comedy Central, the station or the channel that broadcasts South Park, inserted audio bleeps and large blocks of black reading censored at the very mention of Muhammad to prevent more hurt feelings. And as those clever guys at South Park said, well, like we lost. And we too may lose if we don't recognise the tactics, let alone the consequences, because we're left, after all, with a new norm of anticipatory surrender and self-censorship. The victim game works so well because it's augmented by laws, the apparatus of the state that, again, Jim mentioned. The prosecutions are mounting. Gert Wilders in Holland, writers Mark Stein and Ezra Levant in Canada, and our own um, Andrew Bolt in Australia, who is facing a um, claim by a group of Aborigines, as we've already heard. The PC crowd, after all, is clever, and they're not having us on. They know that there are no useful tests, after all, about hurt feelings and inciting hate. They enact nice-sounding laws, they build bureaucracies and they wait for them to blossom, and they bludgeon free speech. They have effectively co-opted Islamic-style oppression to prohibit debate, be it about Islam or anything else they wish to fence off from free speech. The other trick is to quietly exclude certain people from national discourse. We've seen that in Australia just in the last few days um, with Tiro. So perhaps it's appropriate that I um, will quote a German word, which is Toschwick tactic. And to be toshed is to be subjected to death by silence. 
Books, ideas and people that challenge the status quo are simply ignored. No, the ABC has not interviewed Tiro, neither has the Sydney Morning Herald or any of the Fairfax newspapers. Um, Shelley Gare wrote about this most recently in Quadrant last year when she said that to be toshed, people find that their efforts are left to expire soundlessly like a butterfly in a jar. It happened to Orwell when he wrote his 1938 classic homage to Catalonia, which addressed Stalinist Russia's involvement in the Spanish Civil War. The left-wing literati simply ignored it. By the time Orwell died in 1950, barely 1,500 copies of his book had been sold. And the same death by silence was used to ignore Australian writers such as Chris Kenny, who challenged the secret women's business in relation to the Hindmarsh Island affair, and it was used in relation to author Kate Jennings when she um, aimed her fire at the sisterhood and postmodernism. It's used by those who tell us that climate change will destroy us if we don't act immediately. The skeptics are being toshed. Opposing views? What opposing views? Governments, of course, have their own tactics, and in recent times in Australia, those with poor ideas and even worse policies have resorted to something best described as the bipartisanship racket to fence off themselves from criticism. The former Prem uh, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd called for bipartisanship, you may recall, on Indigenous policies, which sounds all rather nice, until it soon became clear that Mr Rudd was looking for supine obedience to his agenda. There could be no disagreement, for example, when it came back to the roll when it came to the rollback of the Northern Territory intervention. And if you dared to disagree, then of course you were accused of politicizing the issue. Now just imagine if these kinds of calls from those defending the status quo had managed to shut out uh, the ideas um, of people such as Noel Pearson. No, I think the very last thing we want is bipartisanship when it's used so blatantly to stifle dissent and to vest moral authority in one voice. The Rudd government, though, tried bipartisanship scam again with climate change and immigration. And each time the aim is the same, to place limits on free debate, to get us to rubber stamp government policy rather than to analyse it. Another similar trick emerged from Canberra last year, this time from the cloistered offices of the Federal Treasury. Treasury boss Ken Henry demanded a con supporting consensus from academic economists on major policy issues such as the emissions trading system and the then uh, super profits tax on mining companies. In one breath, Mr. Tr Mr Henry said that he supported the contest of ideas but then said that, quote, on occasions there, there are occasions on which economists might, at least for a period, put down their weapons and join a consensus. This ought to send shudders up our spine when a senior bureaucrat who crafts a policy that, at least according to some, threatens to undermine Australia's economy, then demands obedience from the country's economists. But as we know, Mr Henry lost that debate, and that, of course, is the point of free debate. It's the single most effective mechanism for disposing of bad ideas. Ideas are not finessed through consensus or bipartisanship. Now, the aim of political correctness, as I said, is to tell people what to think, to stop individuals from thinking for themselves. So if we're serious about defending free speech, then vigilance, demand, vigilance demands that we look out for the tricks and that we test the trickery against first principles. The alternative simply means more moral disorientation and a weird kind of de Western death wish. And the principles are clear enough, I've said it many times. Free speech is not, as Mark Stein said, a left-right thing. It's a free-unfree thing. You don't get to cry in favour of free speech just to defend those with whom you agree. And free speech must, as Jim said, include the right to offend. Because if we prosecute offensive opinions, we just encourage ever more ridiculous claims to victimhood and protection. We fuel that marketplace of outrage and we end up shutting down the true genius of Western civilization, the contest of ideas. But of course, free speech and the value of debate depends on one more principle, and that is that people truly listen to one another. So on that note, it's my turn to stop talking and to start listening. Thank you. And now over to Brendan. Thank you. Um, my favourite example of political correctness involves the American Navy. In October 2001, after America had invaded Afghanistan, some of its Navy personnel were preparing missiles that were going to be fired at Al-Qaeda and Taliban strongholds. And one of the Navy men decided to write a message on the side of his missile, 
a message to express his anger about 9-11. So in reference to the 9-11 hijackings, he wrote the following message on his missile. Hijack this, you faggots. Now, um, little, little did he know that even, even though the American military had rather a lot on its mind at that time, his message would still cause a massive controversy. And when they heard about what had happened, the upper echelons of the Navy were outraged. They expressed official disapproval of this homophobic message. And they issued a warning that military personnel should more closely edit their spontaneous acts of penmanship. <laughs> and they even issued some unofficial guidelines uh, covering what could and could not be written on the side of post-9-11 missiles. So there should be nothing offensive, the uh, guidelines said. So, for example, it was okay to say something like, I love New York, but it's not okay to use words like faggot. That is my favorite story about political correctness for two reasons. Firstly, because it sums up how psychotically obsessed with language the PC lobby is. Uh, because what these Navy people are effectively saying is that it's, it's okay to kill people, but not to offend them. It's okay to drop a missile on someone's house or someone's cave, just so long as that missile doesn't have anything inappropriate written on the side of it. You know, heaven forbid that the last thing a member of the Taliban should see before having his head blown off is a word reminding him of the existence of homosexuality. <laughs> and this really captures the, the warping of morality that is inherent in political correctness, where you become so myopically focused on speech, on representation, that everything else, including matters of life and death, uh, become subordinate to that. And the second reason it's my favorite example of political correctness is because it captures a truth about political correctness that is far too often overlooked, which is that political correctness is not actually the handiwork of small groups of cultural Marxists or liberal malcontents. The rise and rise of political correctness is not simply down to the activism and agitation of unrepresentative sections of the chattering classes, who detest vulgar language and what they consider to be offensive ideas. If it was, then how could we explain the actions of the American Navy? Why would one of the most powerful, well-armed institutions on Earth buckle under pressure from those kind of people, from people who read The Guardian or The Age? No, political correctness represents something far more profound. The victory of political correctness is built upon the demise and the decay of traditional forms of authority and traditional forms of morality. It is parasitical on the crisis of conservative thought. In fact, I would argue that the power of political correctness is directly proportionate to the weakness of the old, taken for granted forms of morality. Now, I can understand the temptation to see political correctness as simply the imposition of a framework by small groups of illiberal liberals, to see it as a kind of conscious project pushed through by these rather irritating sections of society. And you know, there are two striking things about political correctness which would seem to bolster the view that it is the creation of a cabal of grumpy, misanthropic feminists and, and environmentalists. Firstly, political correctness came to the fore at a time when conservative governments enjoyed strong electoral support. Uh, political correctness really exploded in America and Britain in the 1980s when Reagan and Thatcher were in power. So the masses were largely supporting conservative regimes, yet at the same time, political correctness is born and becomes more and more widespread, boosting the idea that the cut-off cultural elite sat down one day and drew up some rules for everyday life. And secondly, political correctness does tend to be most vociferously promoted by the media and sections of, the, of academia by those rather rarefied, aloof institutions with more than their fair share of worthy people. But to look at PC in that way only, just to see it as a kind of conscious project of illiberal liberals with its list of 13 rules, as Thilo drew out, I think that is to miss the foundation stone of political correctness, the ground upon which it is built, which is the inability of the traditional moralists to justify themselves and to defend their way of life and their moral system. It is that inability which creates a moral vacuum which gets rather feverishly filled up by new forms of uh, intolerant morality. 
Because when you have a profound crisis of traditional and conservative morality, which governed society for so long, then previously normal and unquestioned ways of behaving get called into question. Nothing can be taken for granted anymore, from everyday speech to interpersonal relations, even to nursery rhymes. All the given things of the past 200 or 300 years fall apart, and political correctness fills that hole. It's a tentative takeover by a new kind of modern-day moralist. And the end result is undoubtedly tyrannical and profoundly illiberal and antagonistic to individual autonomy. To see how um, political correctness has its origins in the demise of traditionalism, it's instructive to look at the example of the Girl Guides. Um, for 100 years or so, the Girl Guides in Britain and also in Australia was a fairly straightforward organization. It was designed to instill girls with imperial pride. The Girl Guides had a simple slogan. You had to swear an oath of loyalty to God, Queen, and country. And then about 15 years ago, the British Girl Guides rewrote their constitution. They brought out a new vision statement. They turned one page into about 20 pages. There was no more duty to God. Instead, there was a promise to love my God in recognition of the fact that there are many gods today and there is no one true God or one true uh, religion. It no longer requires girls to swear a duty of a loyalty to the queen. Instead, it encourages them to feel sympathy for the queen because it says, it cannot be easy for her being photographed everywhere she goes. <laughs> now, the key thing here is that nobody invaded the Girl Guide's headquarters and forced them at gunpoint to rewrite their constitution. They did it themselves because those three institutions, God, Queen, and Country, are no longer real sources of authority. All three of them, religion, monarchy, and nationalism, have suffered a profound crisis of legitimacy. And it was the Girl Guide's instinctive recognition of that which led them to rewrite voluntarily their own rules and their own outlook. So political correctness is not cultural Marxists storming the citadel and forcing us to obey them. The fact is that the citadel has collapsed and they are just uh, amongst the rubble trying to fashion a new kind of morality for society. And that is why political correctness is so hysterical and so shrill and so intolerant. Not because, because it is strong, but because it is weak and isolated. It has no real roots in society and it has no real roots in history. It has no popular legitimacy, it has no public support. And it is better seen as a knee-jerk, instinctive imposition of a new morality designed to somehow replace the old. And in that kind of situation, everything must be controlled. No one can be trusted. No one knows what is right and wrong anymore. It is the moral whole at the heart of society that gives rise to this insatiable desire to implement all kinds of new rules and regulations. So even nursery rhymes <coughs> are being rewritten. In the example of Britain, uh, we've recently rewritten the nursery rhyme, What Should We Do With a Drunken Sailor? So now, uh, drunken sailor has been replaced with grumpy pirate, because we don't want children to know about alcohol. The old rhyme used to say, stick him in a bag and beat him senseless. And the new rhyme says, tickle him until he starts to giggle. <laughs> and people refer to it as PC gone mad, you know, these crazy feminists in dungarees in their offices rewriting nursery rhymes and forcing them on schools. But a, a more important question to ask is, what kind of crazy society rewrites rhymes that children sing? What kind of unhinged society does that? Rewrites rhymes that have been around for generations. Only a society which has entirely lost its moral bearings, which can no longer take the most basic things for granted, would do such a ridiculous Orwellian thing. The hysteria of political correctness really speaks to its opportunistic, parasitical nature. A more confident moral system would be able to tolerate deviance. An unconfident, accidental moral system, like political correctness, can tolerate no deviancy at all because it continually fears for its own continued survival. And it's important to bear that in mind because sometimes the critics of political correctness are too quick to play the victim card. Janet described very well and very accurately the way in which politically correct people play the victim card, but sometimes so do un-PC people. 
Too many right-wing thinkers claim that a conspiratorial cabal of PC lunatics is ruining our lives, which conveniently absolve these right-wing and conservative thinkers of having to work out whatever happened to their morality and to their traditions. Where did they go? It is easier to claim that society has been taken over by crazy, lentil-eating, sandal-wearing feminists and annoying greens it is far harder to account for the demise of a way of life that had existed for hundreds of years. We should get to grip with these two facts. Firstly, PC is built on the decay of traditional morality. Secondly, it is weak, it is fragile, it is probably quite easy to demolish. If we bear that in mind, then we can more successfully fight against it, against this profoundly censorious and suspicious and irrational moral system. And if you feel like you are being treated like a heretic, then you should behave like a heretic. And you should pull your socks up and get your guns out. 